Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the fundamental theorem of integer programming. So this is a result that we've already um, introduced essentially back in chapter one, so it will sound definitely familiar. It's something we have always uh, uh, given for granted. Uh, the setting here is we have a mixed integer linear set. Here's our capital S. Uh, as usual, it's the same set we've always been looking at. So it's, uh, we have integer variables x, uh, continuous variables y, and we have just a bunch of linear inequalities, so a finite system ax plus gy less than or equal to b. Good, so um, everything here must be rational. It's very important for the theorem, for the, for the next theorems to hold. So matrices A and G and vector B are all rational, so essentially all our data. So the result that we're going to show, let's say the main result of this section, is that the set capital S admits a perfect formulation that is a rational polyhedron. And this is essentially uh, what we used, uh, as I mentioned back in chapter one, when we discussed that solving a mixed integer linear programming problem reduces to solve a linear programming problem over the convex hull of S, exactly because convex hull of S is a rational polyhedron, so essentially we're using the results that we're going to prove. So uh, here is the statement of um, Mayer's theorem, which is the fundamental theorem of integer programming. It says that if you're given a, a rational data, so again A, G, and B are rational, then let's look at the polytope, uh, sorry, at the polyhedron P given by AX plus GY less than or equal to B and at the corresponding mixed integer linear set, which is the set of points in P with X integral. Then uh, two things. So first, convex is a rational polyhedron. So namely, convex can be written as a set of XY with a prime x plus g prime y less than or equal to b prime for some a prime, g prime, and b prime, which are rational. Furthermore, we, uh, this theorem also shows that if the set S is non empty, then the recession cones of P and of conv S coincide. So the first task in uh, this section is to prove this theorem. And the first thing we want to do is uh, prove it in an easier setting, and that is when P is bounded. So we're going to be proving this lemma. It looks very similar to the theorem we've just stated. So the setup is the same. We have P and S as before. Now we're assuming, though, that P is bounded, and we're claiming that convex is a rational polyhedron, uh, which, of course, will be a rational polytope at this point. Um, so what's the difference with the previous theorem? We're assuming P bounded and also we are not showing the second part essentially of the theorem. Point, this is just point one of the previous theorem, uh, specialized to our new assumption. And of course we don't need the second uh, point because in this case if P is bounded, uh, clearly the recession cone of P and convex will be uh, both just the origin. Good, so then let's prove this lemma. So how are we going to prove this lemma? So the idea here is to uh, subdivide uh, the set capital S into different sets based on the component x of the point. So essentially if you think about uh, the set uh, of points in capital S with the same x, which of course has to be integral, this will form a different uh, polytope inside P, which is then the convex hull of its vertices. Now, if we take uh, these vertices for every uh, polytope of this type that we can derive, the convex hull of all of these vertices will be exactly the convex hull of S. And this is just the whole idea um, that we're going to use to prove this lemma. So let's uh, start, and the first thing we want to do is uh, define the set of possible axes uh, for which there exists a point with that x uh, in uh, capital S. So let me write it. Since P is uh, a polytope, 
the set capital X defined as the set of axes for which there exists a Y with X Y in S is finite. So here we have def uh, defined this set capital X and also notice that it's finite. Next we want to use the set capital X to uh, partition the set capital S uh, based on uh, uh, the component X uh, of the points. So uh, let me write for fixed X bar in capital X, uh, the set, let's call it S X bar, defined as the set of points X bar Y for which X bar Y is in S. Uh, uh, so what I want to say is that this guy is a rational polytope. Well, maybe it's not obvious if we see it based on the definition we just gave, but everything we really need to notice is that this can be written equivalently as a set of points x, y in P uh, with x uh, equal to x bar. So and now this is clearly a polytope because, well, it's contained in P, uh, and it's given by the inequalities defining P and the additional equalities X equal to X bar. So then we can write that this is uh, a rational polytope. So in particular, it's a convex hull of its vertices. Let's call it the set of its vertices v x bar, which are of course rational. Good. So at this point, um, we can just take the union of all these sets, and uh, we're taking the union of a finitely many finite sets, so we obtain. A finite set again. So let's write it since a capital X is finite. Also, let's define a set V as the union for X bar in capital X of the X bar, and it's fine. Good, and we're done, because at this point, uh, the convex hull of S is exactly the convex hull of capital V. So let me write it here. Since conv S equal conv V, we have that conv S is a rational body. And this concludes our proof. Now, the general case of uh, Mayer's theorem is surely more complicated, but what I want to do in this slide is uh, give you essentially this idea. Um, so, what, what do we have to do? We have to essentially think about where are the vertices of the convex hull of S. In general, P is described uh, by minkowski weil as the convex uh, combination of uh, its vertices, in this case these two guys over here, plus a conic combination of its rays, in this case these two guys over here. And um, of course the convex hull of the vertices of P, so this segment, doesn't necessarily contain all the vertices of convex. In fact, in this case it doesn't contain any of them because they, they're just somewhere inside the polyhedron. However, what we're going to show, which is clear from this picture, is that all the vertices of convex, in fact, are quite close to the convex hull of V1 and V2. Essentially, what we have to do is take the convex hull of V1 and V2 uh, and add to them the extreme rays of uh, the recession cone 
and of course arrays are only defined up to scaling and here we just need to take any integral scaling of uh, such rays. Good. Uh, so this essentially this observation will allow us to uh, prove this theorem. Of course, it's still unclear uh, why uh, or how, but let's keep in mind this picture because it will definitely help us uh, in the proof in order to understand the proof. Good. So let's get then to uh, the proof by theorem three dot. 37 and that's what we call the decomposition theorem for polyhedra. There exists vertices V1, Vt, I mean they're not necessarily vertices, V points V1, Vt until R1 rq such that p is the convex hull of v1 vt plus the conical of r1 rq so now uh, we know here that um, p could have a linearity space so these are not necessarily vertices they're just uh, this v1 vt they're just uh, generally points in the minimal phases of P, but I strongly recommend you keep as a running example in your mind the picture we've seen before, so I, or at least uh, a pointed polyhedron which has vertices uh, to make things a little bit clearer in your head. So the first thing is to, to notice is that all these uh, vectors that we have just written uh, are rational because uh, the system defining P is rational. And furthermore, then we can scale the extreme rays in order to make them integral. So let's try it. Good. Now we have everything we need to define the truncation of P, which was the gray region in the picture before. So this region that uh, we essentially conjecture contains uh, all the vertices of convex. So let's write it down. Consider the truncation of P defined by the vectors x, y that can be written as convex combination of the vi's plus uh, not really, let's say, uh, an almost conic combination of the rays. So this is our uh, vector x, y. And we just need to write conditions on the lambdas and mu. So lambdas are just convex combinations. So sum of the lambda I equal one, or I equal one until t. And lambda greater than or equal to zero. And then what about mu? If this was just a conic combination, we would have just a mu greater than or equal to zero, but here we add the less than or equal to one. So that's how we truncate the polytope. Good. Now, this is also a rational polyhedron. Why? Because uh, all the data describing the system is rational. So, right, all the VIs and RJs are rational. So this is a rational polyhedron. So let me write it. Since V1, Vt, and, and R1, RQ are rational. T is a rational polyhedron. Mm. 
Moreover, T is a polytop. Why is that? So, question for you why exactly figure out all the details so let me give you the idea essentially look at the points x y that we just uh, have in the set t they are the points that you can write in this way good now you see that all the multipliers are bounded between 0 and 1 because well mu is clearly written mu between 0 and 1 what about lambda? Well, it's greater than or equal to zero and also upper bounded by one because of the equality sum of the lambda i is equal to one. So this is just a, these are bounded combinations of vectors, of finitely many vectors, so they must be bounded as well. Uh, this is just, of course, the idea. You should figure out uh, a formally correct proof. Good, so at this point, we're ready to define the two sets um, corresponding, uh, one corresponding to T and one corresponding to the recession cone of uh, P that allow us to break down uh, S into the Minkowski sum of two different sets. So let's write these definitions. Let, oops, let Ti be defined as just a points in t with x integral so the set of xy in t such that x integral and ri so ri it's a type of set that we've never really seen before this is the sum of the mu j rj for j equal to 1 until q so so far so good nothing new but uh, what I want to enforce here is that mu is not only greater than or equal to zero, but it's also integral. So these are just integer combinations of our rays rj's. What we want to show is that s is equal to ti plus ri. So this will take us a, a little bit of work to do. And uh, the first thing we do, is, so the easy uh, containment is the following. Clearly, S is a superset of Ti plus Ri. So why is that? Well, pick any point in uh, Ti. This is in T and with X integral. And now we add to it a vector in Ri. This is a vector in the recession cone of P. So we're still inside P for sure, and it's also integral, so we're summing a, a vector in Ti, which has already x integral, with a vector that is fully integral, so the x component of this vector will remain fully integral. And that's, how, uh, that's the reason why the sum of these points is uh, not only in P, but also in S. Good, so this is easy, uh, if you want to uh, fully understand it, uh, please uh, write down the full proof that I have somewhat uh, said. And let's instead focus on the reverse inclusion. It's a little bit more difficult. So for the reverse inclusion, pick a point x bar, y bar in S. We want to show it is in uh, Ti plus Ri. So essentially what I want to do is explicitly write uh, x bar y bar as the sum of these two vectors. So um, what do we know? We know that x bar y bar is in P and this immediately implies that we can write x bar y bar as a combination of our vi's and our j's. So let's write it. There exists lambda mu greater than or equal to zero with the sum of the lambda i for i that goes from 1 to t equal to 1, such that x bar y bar equal to the sum of lambda i v i, as always for i that goes from 1 to t plus the sum for j that goes from 1 until q of the mu j rj. 
Okay, now we're going to use the sums to define the two vectors uh, that uh, one will be in TI and one in RI. So I'm going to keep uh, the convex combination as it is. I, I, okay, I can leave the sums without the indices, you know what I mean. And uh, now for the conic combination, I'm breaking down, I'm breaking it down in an obvious way, in such a way that the first point I obtain is uh, in uh, the truncated polyhedron. So what do I need? I need the mu at most one, so I artificially make it at most one by taking mu j minus the floor of mu j times rj, and of course I am left with what's left. And this is exactly the floor of mu j times rj. Good, and now I define this first part to be, let's call it x prime, y prime. And the second part, I define it to be r. Let's call it r. So what can we say? Uh, let's focus on r, which is simpler. So look at r. This is by definition in ri, right? This is just an integer combination of the rj. So immediately by definition, R is in R i. So what about then x prime y prime? So the first thing we notice is that the multiplier on the j's is uh, between zero and one, so which implies that it's in T. So let's write it: uh, mu j minus the floor of mu j is between zero and one, which implies x prime y prime is in T. Now, though, if you remember, we want to claim actually that this point is in Ti, so we want to show that x prime is integral. So what is exactly x prime using the equality that we just have above here? We have that x prime is x bar minus the components of R, which, are, uh, which correspond to the x space, but R is integral, therefore, uh, x prime will be integral as well. So let's write uh, x bar and r integral imply x prime integral. So we have x prime y prime in Ti. And this concludes our claim. So we have finally shown uh, this, that s is equal to ti plus ri. And so we can continue now and use this, uh, this equality. And uh, everything we're going to do now is take uh, the convex hull of this set. So we take the convex hull of s, remember that's what the theorem is about, we want to discuss the convex hull of s, and so that's the convex hull of ti plus ri, and uh, Minkowski sum uh, can be brought out of the convex hull. This is an exercise you have in one of your assignment sheets. So let me write it. Recall that the convex hull of a Minkowski sum is the Minkowski sum. of the convex hulls. And uh, if you want to look at it, it is exercise 3.10. So we know that S is equal to Ti plus Ri, and this therefore implies that convex is equal to the conv of Ti, plus the conv of Ri. So what I want to do now is understand what are these two, conv Ti and conv Ri. Again, the simpler one to understand is conv of Ri, because uh, uh, it's exactly the cone defined by the vertices uh, R1 until Rq. So clearly, conv of Ri 
is equal to the cone of R1 until RQ. And uh, then what do we know instead about the conv of Ti? Well, we know that T is a polytope. So uh, now we can just apply the lemma that we've shown before this theorem. So uh, because we have the assumption that the set is bounded. So let's uh, say since T is a polytope, lemma implies that con of Ti is a rational polytope. Good, so at this point we have a um, con and a rational polytope. And so by Minkowski Weil, convex is a rational polyhedron. And also, since conv Ti is bounded, its recession cone is, ex is exactly conv of Ri. So let's conclude. Thus, convex is a rational polyhedron. having the same recession cone as P. And this concludes our proof. In the proof of Mayer's theorem, we have used this type of cone, which is an integer combination of a bunch of vectors. So here I just want to define formally, uh, I mean, I just wanted to introduce some notation for this type of cones so that we can use them later. So we're given a set of uh, vectors, capital R, let's say, and we denote by int cone, which stands for integer cone of R, the, the set that we looked at exactly in the proof. So what was this? Well, we, we take uh, any a combination of the vectors Ri's in the set capital R, uh, but only with uh, non-negative integer coefficients. Good. So then uh, we can immediately write the following corollary. It doesn't look particularly interesting now, but we're going to use it later, uh, later on in this chapter for a representability result. So we're definitely going to need it. Uh, and it follows directly from the proof, from what we have seen in the proof of Mayer's theorem. So let's read through this. We have uh, uh, the same setting as Mayer's theorem. So we have a rational polyhedron and we look at the mixed integer points uh, uh, inside P and we denote those by S. And uh, what this corollary says is that there exist finitely many rational polytopes, P1 until PK, in the same space and some vectors r1 until rq such that the set capital S of feasible points is exactly the union of these finitely many rational polytopes plus the integer cone of these uh, integer vectors. And how can we prove this? Well, we've seen that because in the proof of Mayer's theorem, uh, we wrote down this general set S as Ti plus Ri, where Ri was exactly the integer cone of R1 until Rq. We just didn't call it this way because we hadn't introduced this uh, notation yet. And Ti was instead the union of finitely many rational polytopes as we've seen in the proof. So great, let's keep then in mind this corollary so that we can refer to it later. Good, so the next thing I want to mention is the rationality assumption in Mayer's theorem. So um, we had the assumption in Mayer's theorem that all the data is uh, rational. And in fact, uh, what you can check is that this assumption is fundamental for the theorem to hold. And uh, well, one might wonder if just uh, dropping the rationality assumption in Mayer's theorem results in just uh, obtaining uh, 
that converse is a polyhedron and not necessarily a rational polyhedron. So essentially, you, one may, might wonder if you can just remove rational every time it appears uh, in uh, the statement of Mayer's theorem. Just cross out this word and see if the result still holds. And in fact, it's not true. If you remove the rationality assumption, even just from A and G, uh, then uh, you might obtain something that is not even polyhedral. And here, this is a very good exercise for you. Think about uh, possibilities uh, uh, and try to understand how convex might look like if uh, A and G can be indeed irrational. And essentially, you can see um, examples of convex not being a polyhedron already in dimension 2. That's definitely good enough for you to think about counterexample, this type of examples. And there are at least a couple of behaviors of the set convex that you can find out. So for example, one, so in one of these two cases, the set convex will be essentially almost like a polyhedron. The only difference is that it will be missing some points on the boundary. And so essentially the closure of this set is a, in some cases polyhedral, while the set convex is not a polyhedron. Another type of example that you can construct instead, which is kind of very different, uh, the result is very different, is uh, where convex is a closed set, but it's uh, not a polyhedron because it's actually defined by an infinite system of linear inequalities. So still it's defined just by linear inequalities, but uh, infinitely many of them. So think about these two examples, uh, or maybe more, try to understand how this uh, set convex might look like if you drop this rationality assumption. Good, so the next thing that I wanna look at is um, the result that mixed integer linear programming feasibility is uh, in NP. And uh, why do I wanna look at this result now? Because essentially the proof for this result uh, is um, uh, a modification of the proof of Mayer's theorem. We just need to, to use a couple more ingredients, which we have seen essentially already before. So we discussed already the fact that mixed integer linear programming feasibility is in NP, and I told you uh, back in chapter one that uh, it's, a, it's a kind of an advanced result and we're gonna see it later, so now is the time. So recall what is a mixed integer linear programming feasibility problem, here it is. So we're given a rational data, matrices A, G, and right-hand side B, and as always, we look at the mixed integer linear set S defined by a x plus g y less than or equal to b, and everything is non-negative, and plus uh, we also have that the x variables are integral. So the question is, uh, is this set non-empty? And what we're going to show now is that this decision problem is in fact in NP. So almost all the results uh, where some decision problem is in NP that we've seen rely on giving as a, a polynomial certificate a point in the set. And so um, what, did we do, what did we do for example in linear programming where we discussed that a vertex serves as a certificate because it always has polynomial size. So what we're gonna show then to prove that mixed integer linear programming feasibility is in NP is this lemma. So we look again at our set capital S as before, and uh, we use capital L to denote the maximum encoding size of uh, every coefficient in A, G, and B. So then every vertex of conv S has encoding size polynomially bounded by N plus P and L. So in a sense, very similar to the linear programming case, essentially what you would expect. Uh, in, in LP, a certificate was a vertex of the polyhedron. Now it's a vertex of the convex hull of feasible points. Of course, we have to show this lemma because uh, why would this point have a polynomial encoding size? This is at the moment unclear. That's what we have to show in this lemma. Once we have shown that lemma 4.35 is correct, then of course 
we know that the mixed integer linear programming feasibility is in NP because if the uh, set is indeed non-empty, then we can use as a certificate any vertex x by y bar of convex. Uh, this is a certificate of feasibility because it has polynomial size and, and you can easily check uh, that it is indeed uh, in uh, uh, capital S in polynomial time. Okay, so we need a couple of ingredients on top of the proof of Mayer's theorem to show uh, this lemma. And these two results are the first one, an extension of the result that LP feasibility is in NP. Uh, this result, uh, LP feasibility is in NP, we saw it already in chapter one, we discussed it, uh, and we only focused on the vertices, of course, of the polyhedron. Here, we only have to focus also, on top of that, on the extreme rays of uh, the polyhedron. So that's the only difference. The other result is Carl Theodore's theorem, and we're just going to use it as we've already seen it. Okay, so this is uh, the extension of LP feasibilities in NP. I'm now going to prove this result is an exercise, and essentially it's uh, the same exact argument that we used to prove that LP, LP feasibilities in NP. The only thing is that you have to do essentially the same argument for the extreme rays. Uh, it's not exactly the same argument because, uh, uh, well, because uh, rays are defined only up to scaling, so it's a good exercise to figure this out. And uh, es yeah, essentially you need to use proposition 1.2, which is exactly the same we use for the vertices. So let's read through this theorem. We have a polyhedron here, so there's no integrality at all in this theorem. We have a a polyhedron, ax less than or equal to b, uh, pointed, everything is rational. Let's denote the vertices of p by v1 until vp, and by r1 until rq, the extreme rays. Then, if we use, again, capital L to denote the encoding size of uh, every coefficient of a and b, then every vector v and every vector r can be written with encoding size polynomially bounded by n and l. So once again, if we only think about the v's and forget about these r's, that's exact, this is exactly what we saw to show that linear programming is in NP. So here it's a little bit uh, more than that. Good. Uh, so then the next result that we want to use is Carter Theodore's theorem. Here I just copy paste the result we've seen back in chapter 3. Uh, which is the, the most general form of Carter Theodore's theorem. If we have a pointed polyhedron P, then every point in P can be written as the sum of a convex combination of uh, at most dim P plus 1 affine independent vertices of P and of a conic combination of at most dimension of recession cone of P, linearly independent extreme rays of P. So just a reminder so that um, because we're going to use it very soon. Great, at this point we're ready to prove uh, lemma 4.35, so let's switch to um, the notes. So here is the statement, and um, so what's the idea? We want to look at our polyhedron P, uh, defined as always as a set of points satisfying ax plus gy less than or equal to B and non-negativity, so just a linear relaxation of uh, S. And uh, the first thing we want to do is uh, apply our extension of linear programming feasibility to this polyhedron so that we can obtain that all the vertices and all the rays are at polynomial size. So this is just a setup essentially. Uh, let's write it down. Let P be the set of points in R n plus times R p plus such that A x plus G y less than or equal to b then let v1 until v t be the vertices of p and R1 until RQ be its extreme rays. Okay. 
So by theorem 3.38, all the vi and the rj can be written so that their encoding size is polynomially bounded. by n plus p and capital L. Also, on top of that, we can always rescale our rays so that they're integral. And again, we have seen back in chapter 1 that um, the size remains polynomial in uh, n plus p and L. So, by remark 1.1 we may assume all rj integral. Okay, so our next, next task is to simply use Carter Theodoris theorem. We pick a vertex of convex, which remember is what we want to show uh, is our certificate, what we want to show that has small size. And uh, we use it, uh, we use Carter Theodore's theorem to write it as a convex combination plus a conic combination of few of the VIs and few of the RJs. So let's do that. Let x bar y bar be a vertex. of convex since x bar y bar is in p by Carthiodorus theorem x bar y bar is in the convex al of only n plus p plus 1 vi's without loss of generality the first ones plus the cone of only n plus p of the ri's or rj's and again with a loss of generality just the first n minus n plus p and so let's call this new set Q, which of course is a subset of P. And let me just note here up to reordering the VI and the RJ. Okay, so uh, I just mentioned that Q is a subset of P. So, since x bar y bar was a vertex of uh, the feasible points in P, it will also be a vertex of the convex hull of the feasible points in Q, since that's just a subset and this point is still there. So, is a, a vertex of uh, conv Q intersected. Zn times Rp. Okay, so good. Uh, now we have somewhat set up um, the um, what we needed in order to now use the proof of Mayer's theorem. Remember, I told you that this proof is essentially a modification of uh, Mayer's theorem of the proof of Mayer's theorem. We just need to use two ingredients on top of that pretty much, and we just use both of them. First, we use this extension of LP is in MP, and then we use Carter Theodore's theorem. So what we want to do now, let me write it, is applying the proof of Mayer's theorem to 
to q. So what do we obtain? That there exists. So we're looking at the truncation of q. So let's write it. There exists lambda greater than or equal to zero, sum for i equal one until n plus p plus one of lambda i equal to one and zero mu one such that the vector x bar y bar is in this truncation. This is exactly what we did uh, in uh, the proof of Meyer theorem. Remember, this holds because, uh, because this point is a vertex of the convex hull of the points that are feasible and in Q. Good. So now, essentially, this equality already allows us to show that the vector x bar has polynomial size. Why? So if uh, we denote by theta the largest absolute value of an entry in the vectors vi and rj, it follows that. The absolute value of x bar i is uh, upper bounded by what? So every entry, so let's look at the above inequality. Every entry of vi and rj is at most theta. So what happens with the multipliers? Well, every mu j is at most one, and the sum of all the lambda i is, is uh, at most uh, well, it's exactly one. Therefore, we obtain that this uh, absolute value is upper bounded by theta, oh, sorry, by theta, which multiplies one from the lambda i's plus n plus p from the mu j's. And this happens for every i equal one until n. Perfect. So, we know at this point that x bar is an integral vector and uh, its uh, absolute value is bounded by this number, which is a, a polynomial in n plus p and theta. So we're done. Let's write. So we're done with x bar. Since x bar is integral, its encoding size. is polynomially bounded by n plus p and l, which is what we wanted. Good, so at this point we're done with x bar. Why are we not done with the y bar? Uh, the same argument in fact applies. The only difference is that y bar might be not integral. So therefore y bar still can be upper bounded in the same way but it can be i don't know one uh, you know like a very small number one over a number that is non polynomial in uh, n plus p and l therefore we cannot argue that the same thing for y bar that easily we need a little bit uh, uh, of uh, a better argument so and what we're going to use is the following the idea is the following that pick your x bar y bar and now look at the polyhedron obtained from p by setting x equal to x bar. So essentially you take a slice of this polyhedron only in the y space. So you obtain just a polyhedron in the y space. Now, the point y bar will be a vertex of this new polyhedron and therefore we can use, uh, again, essentially the result that every vertex is of polynomial size in a polyhedron and conclude our argument. So let's write step by step what we have to do. So first, x bar, y bar is a vertex of convex 
which implies that y bar is a vertex of the polyhedron y in r plus p such that gy less than or equal to b minus a x bar so we're fixing x bar now the, what is the data in this polyhedron well we have g of course we have b and i mean b minus a x bar because that at this point is data but x bar we just saw that is polynomial size so does a x bar and so does b minus a x bar so all the data here is of polynomial size and this allows us to conclude that let's write since the encoding size of x bar is polynomial Theorem 3.38 implies that the encoding size of y bar is also polynomially bounded by n plus p and l. And that's it. That's everything we have to show. And this concludes our proof of the lemma 4.35, which therefore uh, implies that mixed integer linear programming feasibility is in NP. And this is the end of uh, today's lecture.